Welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany. This is lecture six, where we'll try to answer the question, how do you assemble a cladogram or phylogenetic tree using fossils? The methods that we use to organize species has undergone a major revolution in the last 30 years or so. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it has changed, some of the current methods for recognizing groups of species, and then I'm going to basically do a step-by-step -step, um, demonstration showing how you go about doing the methods of phylogenetic systematics. So let's start with the old way in which we used to organize life. So here's an example using a uh, bear, so Urs Ursulus arctos. So Ursulus arctos, the grizzly bear, belongs to the genus Ursulus with the black bear and the family Ursidae. The bear family also includes pandas. They are members of the order Carnivora, which also include fox. And they are members of the class Mammalia, which includes all mammals, so includes squirrels, which are members of a group Chordata, which include all of the animals with backbones like snakes and fish. And they belong to the kingdom of Animalia, which includes all animals. And so this is a hierarchical classification scheme that was developed. And it was very useful to do this. You could sort of think of these as bins that you can throw species into. Prior to the hierarchical classification system that we had for life, we had Aristotle's system that was developed by the Greeks. And that was the scala naturale, which was this idea that everything was sort of on a scale um, with gods at the top and with minerals and rocks sort of at the bottom, sort of things that didn't, weren't living. And people were kind of in between, and everybody sort of ranked on the scale of where they were. Um, it was a kind of a very linear way of sort of organizing everything, but it was first developed by Aristotle. Um, so Linnaeus' system was a step above what was being used even prior to that. The discovery that there's this process called evolution, we suddenly realized that things were branching, that basically nature wasn't necessarily hierarchical um, in the organization, that things were evolving and changing along branches, so as a branching tree. So this is a figure um, of Ernest Heckels, who is a famous uh, uh, biologist. This is one of his figures showing the tree of nature. And so it's actually a branching tree. It's not necessarily a hierarchical sort of binning of these organisms. And so we had to kind of change or adjust the way in which we grouped organisms using this new discovery of evolution and that everything is related. This field of science is called taxonomy, which is basically deals with the naming and organiz organizing of the various species. The old idea was that species sort of changed along a lineage, and so there was this sort of continuum, and you see that a little bit reflected in Heckel's sort of diagram. So here's two classic examples from about 100 years ago, sort of the march through time for humans. And these are Bronethier showing sort of this idea that they got bigger and hornier. What we now know is that evolution actually produces these bushy trees where you had lots of early humans that were living alongside each other. And there, there were these branches that would basically extend off. And so really, when we were reflecting nature, it's a bushy tree rather than necessarily uh, a single lineage moving from you know, primitive to more advanced features. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the events that happened from about the 1960s to about the 1990s. It's often referred to as the cladistic wars, or a period of time in which scientists sort of struggled with and grappled with how to actually best go about uh, describing and grouping species together in various groups. There are two kind of scientists that were the initial sort of impetus into this new way of doing things. The scientist below is Edgard Codd, who is a IBM computer scientist. And he didn't do, deal with biology at all. He developed the first relational database systems. These are systems that we use everywhere today. So Facebook, all the social media, Amazon, whenever you make a purchase, on anything on the computer, when you trade stocks, when you do eBay, any of these things that we take for granted today, we kind of owe to this guy. He developed the relational database system, which is a way in which we can classify files and documents and everything based on a whole series of relations that have that, that each of those things or items have in a computer. 
And so anytime you make a file or produce anything, there's a whole long list of things that are relations that are tied to it. The other gentleman didn't even really work with computers. He was an entomologist, studied bugs in Germany. And that's Willie Henning. And Willie Henning uh, was this entomologist who studied bugs. And he was interested in sort of trying to group organisms together. And he developed a system that's very similar to Cod's system. Um, basically on paper, originally, uh, published a very famous book. It got translated into English and sort of changed the way in which we organize uh, species. And we use a relational system of organizing and uh, ranking species. So let me talk a little bit about a relational classification. So relational classification is that you take a taxon. So a taxon could be a species or family or genus. Uh, or you could actually do a single specimen as well. So you, you can put a specimen in there. And then you basically create a table and you list out all the characteristics or characters of that taxa, of that species. So in fossils, this is going to be morphology, so shape and size and dimensions. If you're dealing with genetics, it can be the genetic code just plugged in there. If you're dealing with file structures or something like that, it could be characteristics about that file. This way, when you, you can quickly search the data in these tables to produce things. So like if you want to do a search on all the animals that have giant horns, you could specify that and you would come up with that character and list all of those. These tables are called character matrices or character matrix and here's an example of one. Um, here we have characters, we have 10 characters um, and then we have a list of taxa. These could be species, uh, they could be specimens. Now one of the things you'll notice with this character matrix is you see that there's zeros and ones. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means and you'll see a specified out group. So some of these characters can be what are called polarized. But the characters don't necessarily need to be zeros and ones. They could be basically anything. They could be just numbers or whatever. But they have to have some similarity with the other ones that are in the table. So let's talk about characters and what those zeros and ones actually mean. So polarized characters are characters that require sort of proposing uh, an ancestor versus sort of descendant traits. So when you see a zero, that means it's you're hypothesizing that it's a primitive trait. Um, and so you're saying that that's the, the primitive form. In paleontology, we can do this by looking at the uh, oldest fossils and looking at the characteristics that we see in the oldest fossils. So we specify those as sort of uh, a zero when they have the older, more primitive condition. And if they have the more derived conditions, we can have those be um, more advanced numbers, so one, or two, or three, or four. We can have other sets of numbers going up. Um, and you can actually also specify whether it's a directional. So it, did they have to go from one, zero to one, and one to two? Or could you jump from zero to two, for example, in one of those traits? Nonpolar characters are characters that don't require a proposal of ancestral condition. For example, a DNA sequence. So you can just take a DNA sequence and plug them, them in. And as long as you're matching the right sequences in uh, your alignments, uh, it doesn't matter. You could have A, G, C, U, T, and basically you're running an analysis. When you use nonpolar characters, this is referred to as maximum likelihood analysis. We won't go too much in detail with maximum likelihood uh, analysis since we really don't use uh, nonpolar characters. Most of the characters that we use in paleontology are polar characters in which we propose a primitive condition. So one of the ways you can do this is to uh, include what's referred to as an outgroup. So an outgroup in paleontology is usually a group or a species that's the oldest one or is most closely related to the in-group that you're looking at. So all the other species are considered the in-group and the outgroup is then going to be that sort of one step beyond that group. In paleontology, that's oftentimes uh, a fossil that's older than all the other groups inside. Oftentimes the outgroup is also a species that we know a great deal about. So it's the species that we have a pretty good skeleton. You don't want to use something that's very fragmentary as an outgroup. Now once you've assembled a big huge matrix, you're going to run a bunch of computer algorithms using what's referred to as parsimony analysis. Parsimony analysis is that the preferred tree, the preferred phylogenetic tree, is, that, is a tree that requires the least amount of evolutionary change to, to explain some observed data. 
Maximum parsimony analysis refers to the condition of this preferred tree being the most parsimonious or the one that has the simplest explanation. So what you're doing when you do these computer algorithms is you're a asking the computer to go through all those characters and to construct a tree that explains all the data that you've put into it um, as simply as possible with the fewest changes that occurred. This doesn't necessarily mean that this is the correct tree. It means it's the simplest given the data that's been entered into the system. So trees um, can be unrooted or they can be rooted. So an example of an unrooted tree is below. And this is where you basically run the analysis and you're looking for who's most like the other one. So you're looking at similarities between the various species um, and you're looking to see how those group out. If you root your tree, you're basically specifying one of those branches as being sort of the primitive branch that first split off. Oftentimes, this is going to be your outgroup species. So the oldest species in the fossil record is going to be specified as that first jump, that first group leaving. So here's an example of a rooted tree. These trees are also referred to as cladograms, with each branch being considered a clade. So uh, cladograms can be depicted either with these sort of uh, V lines intersecting or they can be the rectangular type um, that you often see in publications. And this basically is stating that A and B are more closely related to each other than A and C. <clears throat> and so these form sister groups. Both of these um, cladograms show the same information. So you're basically um, pairing each of these species. So these are sister groups. So A and B are cl more closely related. You can just turn around this clade here and B and A being most closely related means the same thing as, uh, as this cladogram, even though the order of the species on the top is different. And that's something that takes a little time to play around with, with understanding which trees are sort of synonymous and they're telling you the same information. And that is just because it doesn't really matter whether A is more closely related to B or B is more closely related to A. They're the same thing. All right, so one of the things about phylogenetic systematics and these cladograms is some of the uh, difficult terminology that we have to get through in describing these things. So let's talk about the first uh, terminology, and that's synapomorphies. So synapomorphies are characters that are derived, so they're those ones, and they're shared between multiple species. So a synapomorphy are basically shared, derived characteristics. An apomorphy is basically a new feature that's not necessarily shared. So um, when we name new species, oftentimes we're looking for an apomorphy. So we're looking for some new feature that's completely different than all the other ones. So when we do cladistics and create these trees, uh, we're actually looking for synapomorphies, so character new features that are that are shared between various species. Synplesomorphies are characters that are primitive and shared between multiple species. So, what's referred to as a plesiomorphy is an old feature. So this might be a feature that's found in uh, the primitive um, outgroup that you're looking at. So here's another um, diagram showing uh, the differences between symplesiomorphy and symapomorphy. So this is sort of from Wikipedia showing the transition of various characters. So we have A, A evolves into A, C, picks up a new trait. So that new trait, C, is an apomorphy. It's a new trait, but at that point it's not shared with anybody. But then A, C splits, and now we have A, C, and A, C, A, C D, and A, C, E. So that C now is a syn apomorphy because it's shared between more than one species. So B would actually be considered a new apomorphy in this case up there. So the A condition, that A characteristic, is a symplesiomorphy because it's ancestral. So it's found in all the groups and it's shared in its, in its uh, an ancestral. The A is sort of considered an ancestral trait. It's not necessarily a new trait, so it's a plesiomorphy. So what we're looking for when we're grouping these things is synapomorphies. So derived characteristics, they're shared between groups. Now there's three different types of groupings we can do with cladograms. Let's take a look at each one. The first one is a monophyletic group, and that's the one that's shaded in yellow there. 
This is a group that includes all descendants from a common ancestor. So you start with the very oldest one and it includes all the branches. If we were to think about taking some pruning shears and cut any of these points on this tree, if we take one cut, the resulting branch that comes off would be a monophyletic group, no matter where we cut it. But we only can make one cut. A paraphyletic group is a group that has a common ancestor but does not include all the descendants. So in this case, it's the blue grouping that includes lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers. So the blue group, we'd have to make two cuts. We'd make, have to make a cut at the base of the tree, and then we'd have to make a cut um, between the tarsiers and New World monkeys to produce that part of the branch of this tree. So that's a paraphyletic group. And then we have a polyphyletic group. A polyphyletic group does not have a common ancestor. So this would be the group that's depicted in red of lorises and tarsiers. Note that they don't share a common ancestor, and so that's a polyphyletic group. Now, philosophically, all groups are paraphyletic because we, of living groups, because we don't know what they're going to evolve into the future. And so we have to think of this without a time axis. So this is one of the things we'll talk a little bit about paleontology, is that cladistics doesn't have a time axis. We're just looking at similarities between organisms. So this can make it a little bit problematic because many of the fossil groups are paraphyletic because oftentimes we don't include some of the living creatures, or the creatures from different time periods. So the only sort of true groups that, that everybody recognizes are monophyletic groups. Monophyletic groups are those groups that include all the descendants from a common ancestor. So that's the group that's depicted in uh, yellow here. If we include tarsiers into this as well, so the group that I now circled in this blue line, that's also a monophyletic group, right? Because we just need to take one um, cut right here on this tree, and then we would have everybody on the ends here. So that's a monophyletic group. So a group that includes tarsiers would be considered a monophyletic group. So there's a couple problems with cladistics and phylogenetic classification that I'll talk about. The first is that there's no time axis. You can't necessarily recognize ancestor-descendant relationships. So if you had one species evolve directly into another species, you, it won't be depicted on a cladogram. In fact, what it would show is that species A is a sister group or sister branch to B. So there's no time axis, and there's no way to use cladistics to show ancestor-descendant relationships. So you're looking at just similarities and grouping those similarities between each other. So you're considering these species as sort of, sort of separate points when you run your analysis. The biggest problem in paleontology is how to deal with missing data. So many times you'll find fossils that don't have a complete skeleton, don't have all the parts preserved. Um, it, oftentimes if you're dealing with both living and fossil groups, you don't have like the soft tissue or you don't have the genetic makeup of the fossils. And so you have to deal with missing data. The way missing data is often done is it's either considered basically being missing, so it means that it could be anything. And so this can be extremely problematic in certain groups where you don't have a really good fossil record and you have lots of missing data that are entered into there. You also can have missing data that represents when you lose a feature or something like that. So if you're coding these characteristics and you're dealing with a group of animals that lost a certain a limb, for example, and you had a bunch of characteristics of that limb, the group that doesn't have the limb, all of a sudden you can't code or you can't enter in the, those characters, and so you have to just put in missing data, even though they're not there. That These groupings don't necessarily have ranks like the Linnaean system that you may have learned. So there's not any sort of specificity in terms of where to put rankings. So these new names that we create for groups using cladistics are what are called rankless. So they don't have the rank of family or order. And this causes all sorts of problems because the number of groupings is only one less than the number of taxa examined. So imagine that you, are, you have a group here, for example, and we could actually name a group for each one of these branches and still have a monophyletic group, right? So we could have group A, group B, group C, group D, group E, group F, group G, group H, group I. They can all have individual names, and we can refer to the, each of those names, and they would each be a separate group. And this has become really problematic in certain fields of paleontology, like 
researchers who work on dinosaurs because every time you propose a new branch of the tree you can propose also a rankless name. So there's literally hundreds of names that can be proposed by various researchers for various groupings and if you also have people debating on which is the correct tree, you can introduce a lot more terminology. So this can become kind of problematic from a sort of linguistic way of how you actually define each of those groups, those rankless groups. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the different types of methods that you use phylogenetic systematics. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit, um, maybe even in class, of each of these techniques and some of the software that's out there. So there's two software programs that are used uh, quite frequently in doing phylogenetic systematics. Uh, the first one is Mesquite, which is um, a, a sort of an offshoot of an older program called McClade that was designed to work on, on old um, Macintosh computers, old Apple computers. The new um, version runs using uh, Java, which is a pretty powerful way of um, programming. You can, it's open source, so it's free. You can run it on any sort of computer that runs Java. So, you know, Linux, you could probably even run it on um, an iPad, for example. The other one, the other computer program is Palp. Um, it hasn't been as updated as frequently. Um, it costs some money to order it. Um, it's actually fairly powerful. It's, it's been used quite a bit, um, but it's being kind of phased out. There's not much uh, uh, interest in, in pursuing it, but it runs on Windows machines and it does pretty good. It's programmed in C++ um, and it does pretty good. It has a really good um, algorithm search associated with it, but the uh, it, with, it has a command line interface. It's a little tricky to learn. There's lots of other software developed through um, bioinformatics um, that's out there. So these probably are uh, the ones we use mostly in paleontology. One of the ones that um, I use uh, more recently instead of PALP is TNT, which is Tree Analysis Using New Technology, uh, which is a program that runs on Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac OS, uh, and you can download it for free as well. Uh, the one caveat is it doesn't use the same files as Mesquite, which uses Nexus files. It uses TNT files, so you have to go through and manually edit your, your files that you produce, so you can run uh, through TNT for your search algorithms. TNT is actually a really cool program because it can run these algorithms really, really fast with really big and large um, character matrices. All right, so let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go out and do a tree. We're going to do a really simple tree. We're going to just look at four trilobites. We're going to see who is most closely related to who. So let's do it. Let's put it together. So the first thing we need to do is make a list of um, characteristics that we see uh, in these trilobites. So I'm using some trilobite terminology here. We're going to learn when we learn about trilobites. So we have the pygidium size. <clears throat> so you can see large, small, large, small. So it has to deal with, so these guys here have a large one, large one, tiny one, tiny one. Eye size, so no eyes, very small eyes, very small eyes, very small eyes. Oh, giant, huge eyes. So large eyes there. The cephalon uh, spine, it's small. Oh, it's large here. Um, it's pretty small, non-existent. And then, uh, yeah, pretty small here. The gabelle size is, is like the nose up here. It's very large in this group, and these guys have small ones. And then we have the segments. So we have just a few segments, many segments, few segments, and many segments. So you can see how we can go through each of these characteristics and we can sort of code each one of these species and say, okay, this is the characteristics we're going to look at. So the next step then is to figure out which is primitive and which is derived. So let's specify taxa 2 as an outgroup. So taxa 2, this trilobite is the oldest trilobite, and we're going to specify it as the outgroup. So that means that all of its characteristics we're going to call zero. And the other ones, if they differ from that, if it's more derived, they'll be one. So there, there we go. So now we have ones and zeros. And usually we will record exactly what a zero and a one would mean in our uh, matrix. So we know exactly what that means when there's a zero or a one, what the characteristics are. So now we have our zeros and ones. Um, we're not using multi-state um, characters here. We just have a list. 
and we have our character matrix. So, all right, we're getting along here. So, one of the first things we notice here is that we have an apomorphy. So, I size being large in taxa 4 is an apomorphy. So, that's a derived characteristic that's not shared with any of the other taxa. Now, if we had to include some other trilobites in here that had large eyes, then that would be a sin apomorphy and be shared with those other large eye species of trilobites. So apomorphies, if we ran this, is not going to reveal any extra information. So it's not going to be very useful for determining sister group relationships. But we'll leave it in there for now. But we do have lots of examples of sin apomorphies. So if we look at the segments, we notice that two of these um, trilobites have reduced number of segments. And that is a synapomorphy because it's shared between two, and it's a derived characteristic that differs from our outgroup. So there we have a synapomorphy. All right, so once we do this, we um, download Mesquite, and we have um, our data. So we have tax on one, two, three, four, and we have our characters that we've listed, and then we can go in and put in the numbers zero or one and we can specify what those characters are. So here we go, here's a really simple, great example of a character matrix in uh, Mystique. And now we can use the software to start searching for the tree, the right tree. All right, so we run the analysis. This could be running Mystique or Palp or TNT. We run the search algorithm and it spits out the trees. And when it spits out the trees, it's gonna to try to minimize the tree length. So when it ran its, its algorithm, it spit out five trees of equal length. So let's talk a little bit about what a length of a tree actually means. All right, so this is one of those five trees that were spit out by the analysis. So it ran its search algorithm, and this is one of five trees. So let's go through and look at each of the characteristics and count the number of changes that we see on the cladogram. So the first one here is pedigium size. And you can see here, I put it as red. That indicates it's a reversal. Since the, this trilobite is our outgroup, it means that there is a reversal. So this tree is arguing that the pedigium was very large. And then in one group, it actually reversed back to the primitive condition. So you can see here we have one change. Let's look at the next character. Here we have eye size. Eye size is an apomorphy, so it's found in only one group, so that counts as one change there. Let's look at gabella size. So again, this is found in that one group, there's one change. So the primitive ancestor, according to this tree, had a small or non-existent gabella. Now let's look at cephalon spine. So this is the one with the long cephalon spine. This is a primitive characteristic. But this tree is arguing that this characteristic is actually probably derived and that it evolved a second time, so it's in red. So the other thing we can look at is the number of segments. This is considered a primitive trait. So this tree is arguing that no, it probably is actually a derived trait. We may have mischaracterized the polarity of it and that in fact we have a change here. So going through, we have five transitions. Let's look at another tree. So here's another tree and I've just numbered here where we see the changes. So in this tree, for example, the petigium size evolved once here and here. So there's one, one change there. The eye size changed there. The um, cephalon spine changed there. It's kind of a reversal there. The gabella changed here. And then five, the segments changed here. So supporting a tree like this. And this tree also has a length of five. All right, now we have to figure out which tree is the right tree. So the analysis found that there are five trees of equal length. All have an equal chance of being correct. Now, if we were to encounter this, especially with this very small and tiny character matrix, we probably want to go out there and find some more characteristics. Maybe we want to add more taxa into this study and then rerun the analysis to reduce that number of trees. So we might run, um, add more, more trilobites and add some more characters, maybe add 50 characters and add as many as we can and rerun the analysis and see what, what happens. One of the things that can happen though is that you run that analysis and you still have more than one tree at the end. So you have multiple 
most parsimonious trees of equal length. In that case, you might want to construct a consensus tree. A consensus tree basically takes the trees that are produced and any of the branches that are in conflict, you break those branches and form what's called a polytomy. So here's a tree in which you have a polytomy. So a polytomy means that these species at these ends of the branches here, results of the analysis were unable to confirm whether one group was more closely related to another group. So you have a polytomy. Sometimes you might want to do a consensus tree on a 50% or majority rule. In that case, that the majority of trees support a certain type of feature. So oftentimes in publications, you will see a consensus tree published rather than all you know, 50 trees if there are 50 trees that were found in the analysis. So here's some important things to consider when you're doing a phylogenetic analysis using fossils. First, a cladogram is only as good as, the, as its character selection. When you're making selections of what characters to include in your matrix, be very careful. You don't want to include ontological changes or differences. You don't want to include sexual dimorphism, those types of changes, pathologies, or even life histories. So if you have um, wear surfaces on the fossils or where their fossils might be uh, not well preserved in certain features, or they're completely arbitrary or very minute characters, you might want to avoid those. So pick very important characters that have some sort of uh, functional meaning or constraint in the organism and are actually very um, support various groupings of organisms in your analysis. The other thing you want to do is select a wide diversity of character types. Some of these characters that you can include are going to be related to a particular habitat or niche, uh, maybe the diet, mode of locomotion, and really have little to do with evolutionary history. When you add new characters into your character matrix, you can actually increase whether you're going to find the true tree or not, but you can also increase confusion. So when you add new characters, you want to make sure that the characters are not necessarily related to the other characters that you put in there. So you want to be very careful when you add characters that you're not just sort of loading it in terms of one or part of the anatomy of the animal that you're putting these characters in for. Another important thing to consider is that each character is considered equally, so with equal weight. Now you can weigh characters in a character matrix. But this is oftentimes very difficult to justify to peers when you go to publish it. You're saying, why is this character weighted 2 versus this character in the elbow that's 1? The important thing to consider, though, is that the garbage you put in is going to be the garbage you put out. So if you're picking very arbitrary characteristics to put into the matrix, you're going to get a really messy and not very clear output when you run your output. So be very careful. Take a lot of time in considering which characters to put in and which characters to leave out. Phylogenetic system X is now the standard. It used to be in that period from the 1960s to the mid-1990s, there were holdouts of people who didn't do phylogenetic systematics. Uh, nowadays, pretty much most of the journals out there require that you put in a phylogenetic systematics uh, analysis when you are publishing a paper, especially publishing a paper on a new species. So I wanted to recommend a couple books uh, if you're interested in phylogenetic systematics um, and learning a little bit more about it. Uh, one book that I highly recommend is uh, Cladistics, the Theory and Practice of Parsimony Analysis. Um, this is published a number of years ago. It's kind of in the mid-90s, but it's a great book and just sort of the nuts and bolts of, um, of phylogenetics and going through some of the simple ways of doing it. There are a lot of books on bioinformatics and, and um, building phylogenetic trees out there, but most of those are catered toward uh, people that work with genetics and DNA. Another thing to check out is the Willie Henning Society, which publishes the journal Cladistics, um, and check out their website. You can also find links to TNT off their website too if you're interested in that. Thank you for watching. Um, this is a part of a lecture series um, of a course at Utah State University. And if you're interested in enrolling in, in a course at Utah State University in paleontology and geology, you should check out the department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and the research that I do, you should check out my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thank you.